to the <laughs> the same answer and that answer is the biggest problem we are facing and in fact the only existential problem that the jewish people are facing is the problem of our internal divisiveness the fact that we simply cannot get along um in israel i'll speak first for my own what i know um i have been living in israel for well over half of the country's existence, which is shocking to me. Uh, my race should be better by now. But not, <laughs> okay, oh um, and I have seen a lot of really difficult times in all of my years, including the murder of the prime minister and the disengagement from Gaza, where there was a tremendous amount of divisiveness going on. Uh, but I've never seen anything like this. This is really unprecedented. Um, I know from my travels here, and I you know, know that here in this country, you know what I'm talking about. You've got your divides. Uh, politically, the divides seem to be very, very pronounced. Um, and if all that were bad enough, the div divisions between Jews in Israel and Jews in the United States appears to be growing. Um, and to put it very crudely, what some demographers in Israel say, just to really sum it up in a simplistic manner, Jews in Israel are moving to the right, Jews in the United States and elsewhere are moving to the left. And if that is the overall trend, then you just imagine that chasm that just keeps on growing. And of course, we all have really good reasons for believing what we believe, for holding the opinions that we hold, and for opposing positions of those other people. We, we're, we're right. Um, but as our former president, Ruby Ruben Ru Rivlin, said, victory in the battle between us means losing the war of existence, right? If we win, we lose. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that there's, there's, there are some people who are happy about this increasing divi uh, division and that those are our, our mortal enemies, such as um, Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah in, in Lebanon. And here's a quote from him. For the first time, we are hearing from the Zionist entity a fear of a civil war, bloodshed, and nearing the point of explosion. When they speak of the collapse of the Zionist entity, they are talking about a limit of 80 years. The state will not survive more than that. And we have, we have historians who, who look at our history and actually point out that uh, Jews you know, um, ruling ourselves autonomously that the average duration of that has been about 80 years before we have imploded. Um, so there's a, real, there's a real threat and a real fear of this. Uh, what I want to do with you in the, in the short time that we have here is to trace the problem. This, and maybe, maybe there's some comfort in knowing it isn't new. It's been plaguing us throughout our existence. Does that make me feel better or worse? I don't know. Um, we're right right now. We're in the, in the period of Sirat Omer, And one of the our traditions is that that the, the mourning period is to is to mark or commemorate the, the split with the different students in those days. But this is something that's been with us forever, um, and I want to trace it all the way back to the Bible. So that's that's where I come in, and that's where these pages come in. Um, and as you all know, the, the first human beings that are presented in the in the Bible, um, we have a, a new nuclear family, and I would say they're nuclear in two respects, right? Father and mother and two children, and it is combustible, right? We, we end up with one son killing the other one. The, the story of humanity starts essentially with a fratricide. Uh, and if we look at the book of Genesis, if we follow it all the way through to the end, the two bookends are really all about siblings who can't stand each other to the point where at the beginning, there is an actual fratricide. And at the end, in the story of Joseph and his brothers, there is a near fratricide. Right? We, we find that because things, and we're going to look at that soon, um, because of certain developments, the, the fratricide is, is averted, but that's not because they didn't try. And in between, it's not just the bookends, in between we've got a series of other stories where we have siblings who can't get along with each other. Um, okay, so what, what I want to explore with you here is, first of all, why do we have this consistent theme throughout the foundational book? of our foundational book. Why is it all about the fractured relationships? And why, if it's the story of fractured relationships, why does it focus so insistently on siblings? And hopefully to get to, well, what does all that have to say about our very troubling situation today? Okay, so let's go. Um, the story of Cain and Abel is in source number one on your page. And I'm, I, Rabbi, I would, I, you were gonna give me 
Yeah. What you guys up for it? I, I come from the Pardes Institute of Jewish Studies, where we are really opposed to frontal lectures. Um, and so what I would like to ask you guys to do is to take three minutes, turn this room into a rocking baby drush. Mm -hmm. Take a look at source number one. Um, read it in whatever language is comfortable for you. We've got Hebrew here, English there. And what I'm going to ask you to do as you talk to the person next to you, and please make some noise. This is not for whispery. Um, to, to try to come up with a character sketch of the two brothers, Cain and Abel. If you assume, pretend, acting as if you've never, this is the first time you've ever seen this, and I'm sure that for most of you, this is not the first time you've ever seen it. Try to put preconceptions out of your mind. How would you characterize Cain? How would you characterize Abel based simply on the information that you have here in source number one? You've got three minutes, let's get to it. Please make noise. That's a good question. When you are finished, please eye contact and let me know. He doesn't stand to speak. We don't hear it. Right. Yeah. Even even his mother doesn't have word uh, 
Okay, everyone. This, if we were going to do this justice, it would take a semester. So we're going to have to suffice with this. Let's start with Kate. Any any adjectives? Firstborn. Firstborn. Okay. And what comes along with that? Always getting the short end of the stick. Okay. Wow. You know, I, I should say that whatever you say this evening will tell us more about you than Philadelphia. Yeah. Okay. Firstborn by any chance? Okay. Um, he's a firstborn. What what fits into that firstbornness in here? You said short end of the stick, but what else? Notice, first of all, let's start. Yeah, go ahead. So first ones usually have to be the role model. Good. And they have to have responsibility. Okay, great. And he kind of, like, he gave a little offering to God, but that wasn't that much. Okay, we'll get to the mm -hmm. end in a minute. But he does bring an offering. What about the birth record? Let's just, let's start at the beginning, right? Chava, we get this birth speech by Chava. The man knew Chava, his wife, in the biblical sense. Vatar, Vatemet, and Cain. She conceived and gave birth to Cain. What's odd about that? What should it have said? She conceived and gave birth to a baby, a baby and named him Cain. Mm -hmm. This sounds like he is Cain already at birth, right? There's something Cain about him already. And then we find out what does a Cain mean? She, she could have the little wordplay here. Kaniti ish et Hashem. I have, what's Kaniti? Purchased, Purchased acquired, mm -hmm. or it could mean something else. Kone shamayim va'aretz doesn't mean I bought the heavens and the earth. I had a great day at the shopping mall. Right, right. what? Brought forth. Brought forth, create, creator. Right? It could mean either one. And I would argue that maybe what, what, what Chava is doing is either anticipating or even investing in this child all kinds of thoughts and attitudes, which sometimes happens with the firstborn too, right? All, all the unfinished business of the parents somehow end up at the at the doorstep of that poor firstborn. I, I do I do sympathize. Um, but but notice the, this there's something kind of grand about this child birth. Um, he's born. There's a reason given for his name. There seems to be some hopes and dreams and expectations invested in him. And then comes now child number two. <laughs> but how would you like to be the child in this first announcement? But Tosef Lamedet et Achiv et Havel. She continued to give birth to his brother Havel. Right? It's almost like a like a like a, 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 a collective yawn. Right? He's he is presented in relation to his brother. Um, what else? What's missing here in this birth record? Why is she, Why is she naming him Hevel? We don't even have, right, we, we, uh, she, uh, he, he's et achiv et hevel. What is, there's no speech to about why he's Hevel. And, and we, this is not a, a, an innocent name in the Hebrew Bible. What does the word Hevel mean? Think, think Ecclesiastes. I call Hevel, Havel, Havalim. What does it mean? Vapor is vanity, fleeting, in, insubstantial. The world, right? The, the whole world is, is meaningless. She names this child Hevel, um, and, and uh, it's almost as if there's a, there's a hint to the reader, like don't get too too attacked uh, around for very long. But there seems to be very little, if, if much is invested in Kai and very little is invested in Hevel. Um, and now they choose their professions. Hevel becomes a shepherd and Kayin is a is a tiller of the soil. Let's start with Kayin. Why is he a tiller of the soil? Because that's what? That's what? Okay, he goes into his father's business. What kind of business is this? What do we know about the soil after the Garden of Eden? Uh, it's it's cursed, right? Yeah. It's going to be a schmitzing out there in the field to try to get anything to grow. And somebody's got to take over dad's failed business. And Kayin, <laughs> the firstborn, the responsible one, gets that short end of the stick. says, I'll do it. He steps up. What about Hevel? What's he doing? Hanging out with sheep. Hanging out with sheep. Yes. Now, that is especially unusual, given the fact that human beings at this stage, David, are vegetarians. And so, right, they don't, when are they allowed to eat, to eat meat? Only after the flood, right? So here, they, they're not eating these sheep. There are two able-bodied young men on earth. 
as the Bible presents it. One of them is a, a tiller of the soil doing the hard work to sustain humanity. And the other one, and I'm saying this with love, is a liberal arts major who is sitting under a tree reading a philosophy book while the sheep roam around. Um, and maybe he, he knits a sweater, maybe he takes a little milk, but he's not sustaining humanity. There seems to be something, something very much less responsible about Hebel, something less um, significant about this child, yet, and they seem to be living up or living down to the expectations, but then something, something shifted. And this gentleman over here asked me, why does God accept one offering and not the other? It's a great question. But before we even get to that, whose idea is it to bring an offering? No one has ever brought an offering before in this Bible of ours. And here, one fine day, he has this, this, this idea. I'm going to do this, take this initiative and do this thing that's never been done before. And then his brother says, his me too brother says, me too. Look how it's, look how it's presented here in verse four. The heaven hevi gam hu batosef. She continued to have this child, this Me Too kid, and the Me Too kid says, Me Too, I'm going to do that. What a great idea, brother. Okay, now I want to hear from some firstborns about how they feel about that. How do they feel about this when a brother takes their idea and does it better? That's when you beat them up. Okay. <laughs> because how are you feeling? How are you Weeks with the art, because mm -hmm. only two. Yeah, they tend to have a single word that he speaks. Hevel doesn't. Yeah. Okay. He's just right, so. I mean, maybe he's doing it all with a smirk, but okay. It's. I mean, but you know, it's just. So therefore, so I mean, it, it's hard to say what his intentions are. Oh, it's hard to but, say. But you, you would think that if it's trying to convey intention negatively, mm -hmm. that it would say, and he, you know, said to his brother, okay. I too can give a gift. Okay, or, you know, okay. So that's possible. That you, you're arguing from the absence of any, any uh, challenging information that he wasn't challenging him. I, I you know, there's a there's a wonderful uh, rabbinic statement. You can't compare reading a piece of text a hundred times to reading it a hundred and one times. Mm -hmm. The hundred and first time that I read this, all of a sudden I noticed this wonderful word, the description. There are two adjectives. I heard you guys talking about this. How do we know? And this gets back to your question. How do you know that one is better than the other? So one, we could just say it's because God accepted one and not the other, but that's that's kind of circular. But the other way to look at it is that one offering, Hevel's offering, has adjectives, two adjectives, two positive adjectives from the first of his flock and from the best, the fat, whereas Cain's offering has how many adjectives? Zero. He yeah. brought fruit, right? If I say my son bought me a, 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 a shiny expensive necklace and my daughter bought me a bracelet, what would I, what would I, what would I be communicating about that, right? If I, if I give you two laudatory 
adjectives for one and none for the other, you can infer that there's something, I, I like one more than the other. That's one possibility. But when, when I looked at this, I realized the word bechorot is not a neutral term in the, in the book of Genesis. The book bechorot, all of those sibling rivalries that we're going to encounter are, are about who gets to be the bechor, who gets to be the firstborn. And so is it really an innocent act? Is he, or is he symbol, symbolically intimating something? Like here, let me bring an offering that is a firstborn. Maybe that is somehow saying that's actually what I've got my eye on. Maybe, I don't know. I just thought it's an interesting idea. But in any case, I think it's, it's I, I wanted to bring in something that would hint at it or allow for that possibility because as we're going to see in the, in the world of civic rivalry, it's never a zero sum game. That one of them is absolutely evil and one of them has no part in that in that in that bad dynamic. It seems like maybe maybe there actually is with even with this character Hevel who is who is so obscure, uh, maybe maybe we're getting a hint of something. Okay, in any case, uh, things are going to get really bad now um, because Kayan gets murderously angry. Um, and in the, the expression that's used in the text to, to des describe him is what? what? His face fell by Yiklupana, he's furious. And God now pays him a visit in verse six. Why are you so miserable? Why is your face fallen? And here comes one of the most difficult verses in the entire Hamash, verse seven. Um, I spent literally weeks on this in class, so you are going to be here for weeks now. Verse 7. Halo im tetiv seit, vihim lo tetiv la peta tatat rovet se leto tishu kato batati shogo. It's totally impossible. And so I'm going to just flesh out two terms that are used here. Okay, whatever. Okay, one of them. First of all, isn't this the cutest thing you ever saw? Look at that. Seit. The word seit is a very odd term. If you do well, what is seit? Anybody want to venture a, a translation? What? Carry. Carry, carry or lift. And it's in noun form. If you do well, uplift. Um, I, I, okay, to make, to just really cut through this, what I would like to argue here in this impossible verse is that God is trying to communicate something of great value here. As, as a, he, God is paying a courtesy call to Kai, basically get, get a, a bringing a, a preemptive, preemptive message. Right? He, I, I, I picture Kai standing there like with his weapon ready to strike and God says, hold it, I want to tell you something first. Hello, imtetiv se'et. If you do well, your face has fallen Seit, you want it to lift back up. You want there to be uplift. Here's what you have to do. Tetiv, do better. Stop looking around yourself at everybody else and getting so furious at your brother. How could, how could God like him better than me? It's all about what's inside of you. Tetiv, and then seit. And then God goes on to say, we won't go through the whole thing, but your darkest, deepest inclinations are, yearn toward you, but atati shol bo. You may, what did I just do with that little thing? Oh, rule over bo, over it. I believe that that's what God intends to say to Cain. If you basically rule over your own darkest urges, you won't get yourself in these kinds of, of situations and you will your face will not fall. It's, it's entirely in your hands to clean up your own act, stop looking around you, look inside yourself and just do better. I would like to argue that that's what God is communicating, but Cain hears something else completely because he is so worked up into the state. Hello, imtetit se'et. This word has great resonance in the book of Bereshit. Um, it, at the end of the book, when Yaakov is giving his blessings to his 12 sons, he says to his firstborn, Reuven, Yeter se'et v'yeter az. You have greater elevation over your brothers. He's basically saying, you get to be, you get to be the leader of your brothers. So what Kain is hearing is, oh, yeah, hello in Tetiv, se'et. If you, if you do whatever you got to do, say you will have rulership over your brother. You will get to lord over him, which is really what Kain is looking for, is to win. And atati shol bo, oh, I, I dropped the wrong word there. Um, this word moshel, tim shol bo, rule over it, God is telling him, but what he's hearing is bo, rule over 
and mm. employer, right? That's what he's. That's what he is focused on. Is is basically beating his brother. Uh, and this word Moshel is a really also a really important word in the book of Bereshit. The first time we hear it is in the Garden of Eden, uh, before the Garden of Eden, when in the creation story, when God creates the, the celestial bodies, the sun and the moon and the stars. Here it's actually in source number two. The, 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 the moon is lament, the sun is lament shema tayom to rule the day, and the moon is to rule the night. Right, but basically, I think what God is communicating is we, people are not supposed to, not created to rule over other people. If you want rulership, look up to the sun and the moon and the stars. That's where leadership belongs. But Cain is, is, is kind of arrogating this stuff this to himself and so furious that th there's nothing that God can say that will stop him. He kills his brother. Wait, okay. it sounds like you're going even further. Go ahead. That he's interpreting God as encouraging him to attack his brother. Okay, so he, or that, right, exactly. I mean, that's how he's hearing it. Yes. Not, not that God wants him to kill him, but that God is, he's hearing in those words uh, a kind of confirmation of what he already thinks or feels. Mm -hmm. I think he's in a state and he can't hear anything other than that, mm -hmm. than his own voice being reflected in God's words. Okay. All right, now comes a very strange passage, um, which is the, the record of the murder. Actually, we're still in source number one, Verse eight, el hevel Tell me if there's anything wrong with this verse. Cain said to Hevel, his brother, and they were in the field. Cain arose over Abel, his brother, and killed him. Any problem there? What did you say? Okay, normally when you say A said to B, we're waiting for what A said to B. But instead, the, situ the scene moves, they're in the field, and the murder happens. And so if you look in source number three, we've got the Midrash. Um, whose job it is to like, basically move into spaces and gaps such as this one and say, here's what, here's what could have happened. Here's a, a likely scenario. And here the Midrash presents us with three different scenarios about what this missing dialogue is about. Cain said, and I apologize that it's here only in English, but here it is. Cain said to Abel, his brother, scenario number one in the Midrash, what were they arguing about? They said, Come, let us divide the world. One took the land and the other took the movable objects. One said, the land you are standing on is mine. The other said, oh yeah, well, what you're wearing is mine. One said, take it off. The other said, get off. As a result, Cain arose over Abel his brother. That's scenario number one. Scenario number two, what were they arguing about? One said, in my portion will the holy temple be built. The other said, no, in my portion will the holy temple be built. As a result, Cain arose over Abel, his brother, and killed him. Third scenario with apologies, trigger alert, this is disgusting. Rabbi Yehuda bar Abi said they were arguing about Chava. <laughs> who gets the mother? Basic arithmetic, three men, one woman, who gets mom? Okay, I'm sorry, I did apologize. In any case, I had the privilege of learning this midrash for the first time with my teacher of blessed memory, Nathana Leibovitz, and she encouraged her students to look at this midrash in the abstract. She said, what is it that this midrashim are trying to convey? What are the three scenarios? Basically what she argued is the midrash is saying, here we are about to encounter the first murder, the first war, if you will. And the midrash is essentially asking, why do people do this? Why do people kill each other? Why did they start there and never stop? Why does it perpetuate itself? What makes people kill? And so the Midrashim, three, three different opinions, present three different scenarios. What's the first one? What are they arguing about? What are people fighting about? What are they killing about? Brother. No, Brother. land Brother. and stuff. Number two, Brother. religion. Brother. And number three, Brother. sex, Brother. land, religion, sex, pick a war, any war, and see if it doesn't fit into one of those categories. <laughs> Okay, that's, that's the Midrash. However, Rashi is very hard to please here. He says, that's really nice, but that's not the, the plain sense of this, of this verse. Why? He says the Midrash, the Midrash is asking the wrong question. The question that it's asking in each scenario is, what were they arguing about? Why is that the wrong question? What does it say in the verse? The they're not, what? By Yomer Kayin, it's not two directional. By Yomer Kayin, El Hevel Aviv, it's only one brother talking. And I, I and, and Rashi's read of this, if you look at the next, it's just, just before source number four, 
he engaged in contentious words with him to create a pretext to kill him. And then he says, there are many Midrashim on this. I read them too, but this is the plain sense of the text. But basically, and I read this and I, it just, I, I was blown away by this, this comment in Rashi because I do this as a kind of cause beneath all other causes, which is when the dialogue is absent, when one sibling is not talking with the other, but at the other, where there's only one voice and, 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 and the words are in a sense weaponized, used only not for communication, but as a pretext to kill, that's when the red flags come up and that's when violence is going to be the next, the next step. I think that's, and we'll, if you look at it this way, I think we have that, that, that thought that is introduced at the very beginning of the Book of Breshi and is going to carry itself out to the end, which is where we're going right now. But before we get there, I just want to say, before we move on to Yosef and see the repeat of many of these tropes, um, I want, because my book that you were nice enough to mention is all about biblical stories that are, that are engaged in what I like to call a vibrant conversation with one another. Texts are in dialogue. Even if these people aren't, the texts are, where they use each other's language and themes in order to draw a connection so that we can learn more about both. Um, and so we're gonna see the story of Joseph and his brothers in a second. But before we get there, I just wanna to point to my second favorite technique in Bible study. My first favorite is looking for these stories that are talking to each other. The second is um, what is used, called in German, um, the light vort. It's, it's a leading word, a guiding word, a word that appears in, in, a, in a passage in what seems to be an unusual number of times. The text, unlike our writing, normal writing, where, where synonyms are used to vary language, the Bible uses this wonderful technique of emphatically repeating the same word again and again and again to draw our attention to it so that we will follow its lead and get beneath the text to uncover the meaning that is, that is lying there. And in this one passage that is nine verses long, the story of Cain and Hevel, this little word, ach, appears seven times, including, and unnecessarily, by Yomer Cain el Hevel achi. Uh, by Yaakov Kayan El Hevel Achid, his brother, his brother, his brother, his brother. And that word, I think, is so important here because it basically well, it does several things. First, what it does, uh, I think it draws our attention and gives, uh, brings us to be appropriately horrified at the notion that this is not just a person killing a person, it is a sibling killing a sibling. Um, I think also it, it, it reminds us that if we go back far enough, we are somehow, we are actually almost all siblings. We all trace ourselves back to that one household. But I think it also makes a more subtle point, and this is, I want to get to soon, um, is the notion that there was something particularly fraught. This is the relationship to look out for. Why is the, is, is the book of Gracie so insistent on this theme of, of sibling tension? This relationship is the one that keeps keeps rearing its head and causing the kinds of divisiveness that we are seeing in the world at this very moment. Okay, but that's that, that's that's just previews of things to come. Let's get to source number five. Okay, finally we get to Joseph. Is Joseph just out of the top of your heads? Yosef, is he more like Kayan or more like Heather? Based on just what you know, why is he more like Heather? Oh, you didn't say who said it. Yes, why is he more like him? Um, he tries to um, raise himself above the siblings. He tries to use them. Okay, perhaps he's he good. Them. So if we assume that Hevel is after his brother's position, we can also assume we can clearly see that Yosef has, has got those kind of. of no, that's, the, that's the most praise. Okay, so he's more loved. Maybe we'll start with that. We have a younger sibling. They're both younger. They are both more loved. Uh, we could argue that Hevel seems more preferred by God, um, who acts as a parent, at least in part of the story. And, and who is who loves Yosef the most? Uh, yeah, uh, his father loves him the most. He's faithful. What else? He had like the like just okay. kind of like machine. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. What else? He's flashy. He's flashy. Okay. What else? They're both 
not very popular in among their siblings. Yeah. Is that a fair statement? I mean, their brothers hate them. Sure. Um, and so much so that there is violence. They're both the victims of sibling violence. Uh, Hevel is going to find himself underground for good. And Yosef is going to find himself underground, at least temporarily. Um, I would just add, remember that wonderful word in the birth announcement, the birth record of, of Hevel. That's it. Right? Okay, Yosef. Um, that in Hebrew, it's the same word, this additional child. Um, there's something, some, some kind of reference going on here. What I find actually more interesting than this, I think on, you know, the, on the plainest level, that's the connection to make. But there's also some Kayan in him, right? And maybe there's a little Kayan, a little Hevel in all of us. Uh, but how is he like Kayan? Let's look at source number four to see. I would like to make that case. When we first meet him, he is loved by his father. Here is Yosef, like Cain, using his speech in a weaponized manner, not talking at his brother, brothers, but talking about his brothers. But neither one is talking to the brothers. He's, he is loved more than his brothers. And here he is pressing his advantage by bringing evil reports of his brothers to, so that the father will, will, will uh, prefer him even more, right? To, to, to raise his own status, he puts his brothers down. Um, and the result of this, I, I think there's, there's a, a beautiful quid pro quo here. If you look in the next line, the brothers saw that the father loved him the most, they can't speak peacefully to him. This seems to me to be a reasonable response. You're going to use your speech to press your power over us. We are going to withhold our speech from you. We're not talking to you. You're not going to hear a peaceful word from us toward you. They have removed speech. And what we've got here, I think yet again, is the breakdowns of communication. Uh, where, where a brother is talking about, but nobody's talking to, and violence, again, the red flags come out again, and in fact, violence is the next, the next piece. Uh, but before we get there, I just want to show how Yosef is using his words in a, in a really, really um, power-driven way, where he has these dreams of grandeur, and it's not just any dream. Look at the dream. First of all, the fact that he has to keep telling them about these dreams, which are so thinly veiled that he is their master. But look what the symbolism is in the second dream. The sun and the moon and the stars, the very symbols of memshala, right, of rulership. I'm so great that those symbols are bowing down to me. I am the ruler of the rulers. And they don't miss this, this nuance. They say, in mashol tim sholvan. This word Moshel keeps coming back to us. They, they say, oh, it's, you, you're going to be that obvious that you want to rule over us? That's the equation here that leads them to say, we're not talking to you and we are going to hurt you. Okay. Um, we're going to skip ahead now to the, to the following. There is a lot that has been said and written about the process that the brothers need to go to until reconciliation is possible. I find it more interesting to, to look into the, the notion that um, Yosef has to go through a process too. He is not innocent in this story at all. What is his process? And so to make a long story short, I would argue that his process takes place in the house of Potiphar. Uh, and if you look at source number five, I believe that in, as in many things, it's very hard for us to see our own shortcomings, but sometimes in the best case scenario, if we are on the receiving end of those, those bad traits, sometimes we feel what it's like and we can actually see our own actions for what they are. And what we have in the story, in the story of Joseph and Asia and, and Pontifar's wife is Yosef is on the receiving end of power-driven speech. This story is all about talking. It's talking run wild. In fact, the recurring words in this chapter, we have the word le daber seven times, and the word le mor another seven times, talking, 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 talking. We start with this woman who is called Eshet 
Adonav. We never get her name. She's either Potiphar's wife or notice I've, I've bolded it here. What does Eshet Adonav mean? Well, his wife. master's wife. Okay, let's let's look at it very briefly here. Source number five. His master's wife raised her eyes to Yosef, and she said, lie with me. What kind of seduction scene is this? What is this? What's going on here? What do we call it? It's a command. She is, and in case we missed it, she is referred to as his master's wife. She is the power, she is the power figure in the home. In today's language, we call this sexual harassment by a, by a powerful figure over somebody who has no power, right? And she issues an order, lie with me. And he refuses, and he refuses though, El Eshet Adonav, he is supremely cognizant of her authority over him, but he finds the courage to rebuff her anyway. And then if you just see the words that are used here in the next, the next line, by he can davra el Yosef yom yom. Every day, these same words, shikva, the order, shikva imi, shikva imi. And finally, her verbal assault escalates to a physical assault where she grabs him, um, he gets away, and now she changes her tactic from trying to assault him to um, earning, to, to protecting herself. So she has to gain allies <laughs> within her household. She starts with her household staff, and this is where her ingenious use of language comes in. Uh, in the third line, Vatikra la anshe veta, Vatomer la hem le She said, say, Rehu. Okay, just to, why does she call him an Ish Ivri? What should she have called him? Ish Ivri means a Hebrew man. What would have been the more reasonable, normal term? What should she call him? What is he? Evan Ivri. He's a servant. Why does she call him an Ish Ivri to her, to her household staff, whom she wants to pull over to her side of things? To confer agency. Agency, agency to, and, and, and camaraderie. Right? We have a very hierarchical Egyptian society, how does she create a sense of connection with these servants? She said, she said, instead of, she can't play the class card, they'll say, oh, she, he's a servant, we're servants, who are we gonna side with here? Maybe we're next, right? So what does she say she plays? Which card does she play instead of the card? Each degree, he's a predatory foreigner. We can, we can connect over that during this Hebrew, right? But notice what happens when her husband comes home. Um, the, the, the third to last line, but tidaber elam kadivarim ha elam lemor, talking, 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 talking. This time to her husband, ba elai ha evid ha ivri. What card does she play with her husband? Right there, she has to place the class card. Um, does does her husband? I, I I think this is just a fascinating study. Notice how what he hears the last line by hit ishmor adona. Words, 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 words. That's what he hears. I think it's interesting because I think there's a little hint here that he's called Yosef's master. I think he really likes him. And I think what he's thinking is, oh no, I really like that one, but I'm going to have to give him up because my wife is making this public, um, this public accusation. Who am I going to side with? Am I going to say I'm, I'm with him? Um, and I think he's he is he has no choice other than to give him up at the end of the jail. Um, anyway, here is Yosef almost losing his life. He is back in a pit of sorts. The jail is actually called a bore, which is the same word that's used for the pit that he's, that he's in. Um, and now I think this situation, being on the receiving end of his own bad behavior, I think changes him to such an extent that when he finally meets up with his brothers, and this is in source number six, um, we finally have after 13 tortured chapters where this drama is drawn out, uh, we finally get the big reveal. And I think that Yosef now is ready to use his speech in a very different way. And let's look at how different it is. Vayomer Yosef el Echad, source six. Yosef said to his brothers, I need Yosef. Right, big shock. And their response is very familiar. 
ולא יכלו אחד לענות אותו כי נבהלו מפניו. They can't answer it, they're rendered dumbstruck because he's, right, he's got this power, he's shocking, they find out that he's more powerful than they, anybody could have imagined, even Yosef himself, right? So they're, they're, they're silenced by this power, but this time, instead of pressing his advantage, by Yomer Yosef el no, I don't want that anymore. Gishuna Eli, come close to me, by Igashu. And it sounds like he's blaming them. You, I'm Yosef, whom you sold it to Egypt. But then he says, no, actually, but it's a remarkable statement to make. You didn't do it. He's not blaming them. And I think this gets back to time and the notion of looking outside and blaming others. He's basically saying, I, I, this, is all, this all happened. It's all for the good. God did it. I take responsibility now for what's happening. He notice, notice here we use the word Moshel. He is a ruler, but look what he's using his rulership for. This unprecedented, undreamed of, of degree of rulership. At the, the end of the second of this of this passage, I want you close to me, you and your families. I want to sustain you. It's incredible. Basically, what he's saying is, yes, I have that power, but I want to use that power not to, not to control you. I want to use that power to be responsible for you. It's almost as if it's, it's you know, after the whole, we go through the whole book, it's Yosef is answering Kayan's impudent rhetorical question, Hashomer Achianochi, right? Am I my brother's keeper? Here's Yosef saying, you know what? I'm your keepers. I'm going to take care of you. It's not just that I'm going to tolerate you. It's I'm going to stop trying to lord. It's not just that I don't want to control you. I actually want to feel responsible for you. Uh, and I think what we've got here is, is a great turning point to such an extent. And if you look at the last piece here, uh, we have this, what, what, if we don't read it this way, um, the following verse is going to look like the most absurd anti-climax of all time. By Paul, we've got this outburst of emotion that's been pent up for all this time. We've got the brothers falling on each other, crying at each other, weeping and kissing and the whole thing. And then the Acharechen Dibru Echad Ito. And then his brothers talked to him. But if we read it the way we've been reading it, this is in fact the, the, the turning point that we've been waiting for since the first verses of the entire story, which is the brothers withholding that speech and saying, now that we see a new Yosef, what he's doing with his speech. Now we're ready to restore that speech that we withheld from you all those years ago. Um, I'm not by any stretch arguing that, the, that everything is tied up in a neat little bow and that now all the sibling relationships are solved. However, I think we, as we exit the book of Bereshit, we're, we, we're given hope that the dialogue can at least begin. And I think that's what we've got here at the end of Bereshit. However, and here, if with your indulgence, I'm going, to, I'm going to engage in a little bit of a riff, possibly a rant, um, about, about the fact that in addition to giving us hope, this story as a culmination of so many other stories of civil intention is here as a warning sign to, our, to its readers throughout the generations of why this is the relationship that we need to look out for. Okay. To begin with, why the sibling relationship? So first, of course, I'll do caveats. The sibling relationship can be the most fulfilling, the most nourishing, the most enduring, right? Cradle to grave, it's a, there's nothing like a sibling. Okay, it would be boring if I stopped there, right? <laughs> but with this, right, we've got these nuclear texts, right? The nuclear family is nuclear. Uh, so let's start with this. Our siblings are the people who are closest to us. They know us from way back when. They know everything, the deepest, darkest truths about us. Uh, and they see these carefully constructed personae that we have created for ourselves in the world. And sometimes they're standing there going, uh-huh, yeah, right. Okay. Uh, and maybe this can make us feel somewhat threatened, maybe even unworthy. And here I, I collect... I collect quotes about this. So here, here's, here are a few. A 20th century author by the name of Rose McCauley. We know one another's faults, virtues, catastrophes, mortifications, triumphs, rivalries, desires, and how long we can each 
hang by our hands to a bar. We have been banded together under pact codes and tribal laws. Our siblings push buttons that cast us in roles we felt sure we had let go of long ago. The baby, the peacekeeper, the caretaker, the avoider. It doesn't seem to matter how much time has elapsed or how far we have traveled. So basically what these, these people are saying is our siblings are too close to come for comfort something. They're just too right up in our faces. However, the other side of it, what makes things almost impossible is that sometimes we expect them to be, they're not close enough. They're this close, but they're not close enough. They're not exactly like us. And if they veer even the slightest distance from our precise choices and values, we look at that as some kind of a betrayal. And here's another author who says our siblings, they resemble us just enough to make all their differences confusing, infuriating, and at times threatening. Right, so here's the impossible sibling conundrum, right? They can annoy us and threaten us by being too close, but not close enough. And I think if we look around the world, we see that most conflicts are some kind of an extension of the sibling conundrum, right? Who's fighting with each other? It's people who share borders. It's people who live within the borders, right? They're on top of each other. They're in each other's faces. And, but they expect each other, if they're that close, to be identical. And you look at some of the worst conflicts and the worst slaughters in history. It's people who the outside, an outsider would look at them and think they're the same. But there's, and if you think of it in terms of a Venn diagram where you might have 90% in common and 10% difference, and everybody is completely focused on that 10%. And that 10% becomes the difference between allowing each other to live and having to slaughter them. I think about this terrible, like in the 1990s in Rwanda, I'm sure many of you remember this, right? the Hutus and the Tutsis, they, they both speak the same dialect of Bantu, the same little dialect they share. You would think anybody looking at this would say there's absolutely no difference here, but that, that small difference when there's the difference between between living together and slaughtering one another. That's what we, that's what we get. Um, so to get back to us, to the Jews, right? We're, yeah, I, I mean, do I have to say it? We, we feel a disproportionate outrage at those siblings who we expect to be identical to us so much so that if in the religious sphere, if, they, if they're one centimeter to the right of us, they are fanatics, one centimeter to the left of us, Heretics, right? You're, you, you're just, you, 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 I can't even take you seriously if you're, if you're not exactly the same. Um, and in, in Israel, by the way, there are, some of our leaders have claimed that our Venn diagram would look 70-30. And I, I actually believe it's true with, with all the noise that we're making on the basic issues. I think there's a, a, agreement on the part of about 70% of us. Um, anyway, I wanna, I wanna just move toward really ending this with, with a confession. Uh, I have, here, is, here is something that I have, a test that I have under, that I have taken about more than five times and I failed every time. And here it is. I like to call it the LL test. I travel a lot. Uh, and the following scenario, I'm not exaggerating, has happened to me at least five times. Okay, here I am. I'm next in line. I'm the, the earnest young security person is, is asking me questions and I'm answering very earnestly. Um, and then the young woman will look at me and invariably look at the gentleman standing a few paces behind me who's next in line. And often that person is a gentleman in full Hasidic garb. And she looks at me and she looks at him and she says, Atemde yacha, are you two together? And I'm thinking, has this woman lost her senses? Do I have anything like this? And, and, and what is she thinking? Yeah, you look exactly the same. Like, you go, there are religious Jews with shmatas on your head. They're all a certain age coming out of the land. Yes. Right. And I don't know who says it faster or more emphatically, you know, this guy, but we're going to go, no, no, we have absolutely nothing in common. No way are we together. My, my challenge, and I take it on right here and now, the next time, and it will happen again next time, is to take a deep breath and say, Yes, in a really profound way. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know how this guy is going to react to that, but that's his work, not mine. Um, and, okay, thank you. I feel better getting up. And, um, all right. As I, I okay, just to just make it worse, I, I think as <laughs> as our as our gaps are widening, our communication, our potential to communicate is tragically shrinking. Um, I don't have to tell you, right? These echo chambers, these siloed spaces where we pipe in only the opinions that we already hold, 
Um, I think of it in terms, of course, biblically, by Yedaber Al, talking about, we talk about those other people without ever talking to them, right? We can have a group bashing session and we feel really virtuous doing that, but there's no, there's no dialogue that happens. And the Vayomer El, kind of talking at, but not talking to, I think of in terms of the silencing that's going on, the shouting down, the not even letting people speak to, 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 to voice an opinion that's at odds with, with our own opinion. Uh, and, and I think even with all that, what I'm finding to be in my travels, I meet a lot of people. And I once spoke to a group at, at the Hillel and the Hillel director came up to me and he said, you know, you're talking about siblings. We are, our kids don't even have a sense of siblinghood. Like why, who, who even said that we belong to, to the same household that we should even try to get along with each other. We've got a lot of work to do to even begin to formulate those, those answers in our, in our minds and to begin to articulate them to people who don't take these, don't have these same assumptions. In any way, okay, don't you just hate it when a speaker just talks all about what's wrong and doesn't have any solutions? No. I, I don't have solutions, I have thoughts. Um, it, it all comes back to Barishi, always. First of all, um, two-sided conversation. It has to begin to happen. And I, 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 one positive glimmer of hope, what I'm seeing in Israel, is that things have gotten so bad that we have scared ourselves. And now there are all kinds of really interesting initiatives that are, that are taking place where people are reaching out to the, the person that they would never talk to. I have a niece in Jerusalem who, who would organize something, and I love the name she gave it, she called it after the Joseph story, Anashim Achim Anachnu. We are siblings. Call and actually contacting people who, who you know, have the opposite political opinion and, and all shades of it, getting together in living rooms and saying everything, but respectfully without holding back on anything, but actually speaking and, and listening to each other. What are you thinking? Let me, let me actually hear it and think about, understand that you're speaking from some value of yours, even if it doesn't match my own. The idea is to then have the ripples outward where people who attend those will start similar things in their own homes and just keep on expanding that effort. But more, more, more such efforts are happening here. Um, our, we, we invented this, the, the respectful dialogue. You know this from Pardes. You open up a chumash and it's this or, or a gemara. You've got a, a couple of lines of the primary text and a hundred lines of respectful but very heated right, debate, the, the, the inter interpretation. We know how to do this. And I think we have to remember that we know how to do this because we actually created it. Um, okay, consensus document, I have lobbied with people to actually compile it. We do have that 70% in common. Why do we only talk about the 30% that we don't have in common? I don't know, because we're human and we like to do that. Um, and finally, just Tetib Se'et, the Se'et and Tim Shol Bo. Um, what I have, I don't know what's going to solve it, but I know what doesn't solve it. And that is trying to win an argument and, 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 push the blame on everybody else. I think our best strategy each on, on every side of this is to be to, to up our own game and be the best versions of ourselves that we could be. And I'm pretty sure that things will get better if we do that. Um, and anyway, I hope and pray that we can remember that we really are Achim, we really are siblings. And despite all the legitimate anger and pain that we all feel that we will be able to say when asked the question to say it and mean it. That's all I've got. <laughs> um, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to stay for another couple minutes and questions. Comments, criticisms, <laughs> concerns, make it respectful people or else. <laughs> okay. Class dismissed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judy. Yeah. Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, for those who have walked a little bit uh, late, this was a shiur in, um, yes. in memory of Gabi's father and my father. And it's really yeah. wonderful to come together and turn our living room and kitchen into a big madrash. It's great. And um, and now it's back into a kitchen because we're free. So is, uh, please have some, stick around to chat, and uh, thank you again. Everybody's going to want to spend it like this, right? Thank you, everybody. Thank you, to the folks who came on Zoom. Really appreciate you yeah. joining. Um, I want to tell you that she was say, excellent. Uh, I'm going to say Barry? goodnight now and goodbye to everyone. It's too Barry. hard to hear anything.
two oh, laps. You can't hear me? No? She's excellent. What? Excellent. What? She, she was excellent. Thank you. I'll tell her. Yeah. All right. Bye. Good night. Bye.